Hello, we're back in Glasgow at COP26. Uh, today we have Felicia Marcus with us. Uh, Felicia is an attorney and a visiting fellow at Stanford University, specialising in water resource policy. Uh, so first of all, thank you for joining us, Felicia, and welcome. No, it's a pleasure, thanks. Um, first question is a little bit about COP26. Um, what do you think is the most promising outcome to come out of COP26 this year? And with regards to water policy and climate change policy in general, what do you think? It's a great question. It, you know, it depends on your attitude. I mean, whatever comes out, it won't be enough. But I think there's going to be progress. Mm. Uh, and I've been asking people this very question who've been coming to COPS for, some cases, 26 years. Right. And um, I, I think there's a, a promise that since the Paris Agreement, that people have made progress and they're in increasing their commitments and that the framework they came up with has promised to actually uh, create value. I think the real question from the climate side, and there are a number of questions, but one will be, um, do the developed countries come through on their 100 billion promise to help the developing nations in some ways to atone for the problem that the developed countries have caused? Yeah. Um, so that's the big outstanding question is, will they do more than talk and will they step it up? The other one has to do with ambition, you know, which is, are people increasing their goals? And we've seen it over the course of the last year, not just at this COP, just a, a massive increase in the number of countries going to net zero mm -hmm. and being thinking about it, which leads to water. And what I find encouraging, which is that, you know, water has been an afterthought when water is the heart of everything. Yeah. It, com it comes up more in adaptation, which has also been something that has been spurned in past years in the climate world because I think people saw adaptation as capitulation and that we had to work on mitigation to make it and I think they missed the point that by talking about adaptation you make it more real yeah. to regular people to get the political support and more importantly we have to adapt because people are going to be hurt ecosystems are going to be hurt so the delay from a strategic perspective was I think a huge mistake I think that's starting to change. You have the Secretary General of the UN and others this year talking about adaptation and mitigation as two sides of the same coin that we have to do together. I would say, you know, we can walk, talk, and chew gum at the same time. You didn't have to pick. It's like you didn't have to pick between George and Paul, but people do, yeah. right? You didn't have to pick between Coke and Pepsi, although there is a difference there. You didn't, you know, you, it's like picking your team. It's like, no, we need an all of the above, both and strategy yeah. to deal with this massive collective challenge. And I'm starting to see that happen through the course of the last two years. And in this COP in particular, you have, you know, especially in the blue zone, the NGO and the, the country world and the, 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 the myriad panels where people are talking about water. There's a water pavilion, but people are talking about water in other places as not just adaptation, but also mitigation. You have adaptation being talked about in a lot of places and you have the role of nature-based solutions really in the past year accelerating yeah. as people realize that we need to deal with fossil fuels and other emission sources of a of a more manufactured mechanical time but we also have to look at the emissions that come from land disturbance from big fires we don't get to just say well that's natural it'll go yeah. back it's like no we have we have fires that are bigger than the norm because we haven't managed our forests and climate change makes it hotter and that yeah. makes a huge difference so you're having this massive resurgence, and on the main stage, they at least mention these things. Yeah. You know, they had an adaptation day. That's that's progress. But the real question will be what happens next year. Do you think that um, you, you mentioned water pavilions and things? Do you think it's been quite well integrated across all of these different um, pavilions, or do you think there's still a bit of a disconnect between a all these? A bit of a discussions? disconnect. There's a lot more happening in the blue zone. Uh, 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 you know, the sort of civil society, including businesses and others, but civil society is way more than Madrid. In Madrid, there were some of us talking about water, and we realized at the end, well, it's cool, we're here, but we're talking to each other. Yeah. Is that really progress? Here, you're seeing it be more ubiquitous, and it's being mentioned, mentioned at least on the main stage. And so I think that's giving people hope that by next year and whatever, we'll finally be, you know, fully fledged and integrated in terms of then all hands on deck to deal with climate and not ignore water. Water tends to be ignored in a way, because except for the, the massive challenge of clean, safe, and affordable drinking water in parts of the world, parts of the US, and the developed and developing world has um, more of the problem than people might realize. Yeah. If you, aside from that, um, 
water actually is something that touches everything and is a solution set as well as a, a problem to be dealt with. As, as my friend Peter Glick says from the Pacific Institute, if adaptation is the shark, water is its teeth. Yeah. Because that's where you feel the impact first. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it's one of the most vulnerable resources from the climate change impacts. You know? Flood, drought, yeah. sea level rise, Absolutely. just, just and all over the world as well. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, if you think, if there's one piece of information you would like to share with world leaders uh, about water and climate, what would it be? What would one piece of advice be, perhaps? It's all the both and. It would be don't pick winners and losers. Don't, don't just talk about emissions, uh, you know, from manufacturing and energy. And, uh, and clean energy production. We absolutely have to do that as fast as we can, but integrate nature, managing forests yeah. more holistically. They're for multi-benefits, things we should have done anyway. I mean, yeah. when you think about it, we've, we've spent 200, in some cases, a thousand years, but 200 years over-specializing ourselves and missing the point um, and trying to do great infrastructure and manage everything, whereas in fact, climate change gives us a, a, a huge challenge uh, for resilience which is resilience is me you've got to you've got to not just have wider swings in the scenarios that you plan for like the hundred year flood forget that now that yeah. those are going to be happening every five or yeah, ten exactly, years or exactly. in a totally quixotic sort of pattern and we're never going to be able to build our way out of it and so nature-based solutions are the only things that give us the resilience and the buffers to deal with the uncertainty we're in a whole new ball game where uncertainty is the biggest dynamic it's not we're not going through a a linear, if it gets this much harder, hotter, you get this much less water. It, it, it just throws climate into chaos. Yep. And so we have to think very differently and at a systems level. Yeah, thinking more holistically and approaching everything as one integrated thinking. Yes, exactly. Thinking. Um, so you did a lot of work for California water supply and things. Um, do you think that the impacts of climate change are already being felt there? And uh, what, what are the impacts and what do you think is a way the best way of mitigating them impacts at the moment? Well, it's a good question. I'll, I'll just give you a few examples because there are a lot. Yeah. I mean, it, it really just a few degrees temperature rise, and I'm talking Fahrenheit here, a little bit of temperature rise and more of our precipitation, even the same amount falls as rain rather than snow. Yeah. So we get the potential for greater flooding in the spring, but more importantly, we have less snowpack. Yeah. And the whole, if you think about modern California, it is only possible because of this massive system of dams and conveyance that relies on snowpack as 30% of our storage on an average year. Yeah. So we don't have that because our ma major agricultural centers and our population live hundreds of miles from where the water falls. Originally, we have a nightmare coming at us. Uh, I always call it a freight train of pain, you know, where the, the water wars of this past you know, century will seem like a picnic. Mm. compared to what happens and so um, we're already seeing that with a few again few degrees temperature rise where our snowpack is diminished our reservoirs can't do the double and triple duty they do by releasing water and then refilling yeah. with snow melt and releasing water you know the capacity of a reservoir is in its full capacity yeah. it's that refill um, so that's a problem for us the increased temperature has also resulted in even the precipitation that does fall sometimes doesn't even reach the ground it evaporates on the way down. It doesn't run off the way all of our old models said because it's soaking into the very dry ground and yeah. foliage. So we've had a runoff drought, a runoff, and this, it happened just this past year. 600,000 acre feet less from the same amount of precipitation because it was so hot right. that we, it, and, and you know, all our models didn't compensate for that. And it, it caused in the second year of a drought what we experienced in year three and four in the last drought. The other thing is with that increased temperature rise, the wildfires become more intense, combined with that overgrowth from not managing them well, and those catastrophic wildfires send up plumes of carbon, for one thing, but they also cause tremendous uh, problems, not just for pollution in uh, receiving waters, but in silting up with debris and sediment are those reservoirs. Yeah, so they diminish. Yeah. So it's sort of the gift that keeps on giving. So we've, we've got, you know, bad way. We have a lot of problems. What are the answers? Oh, there are a lot of them. You know, one is forest man upper forest management. We've got some great examples of water agencies contributing money, our air resources board, contributing cap and trade dollars, our um, 
forest service engaging to do forest treatments that not only make that watershed safer for the people who live in it, but more water secure and more healthy and less likely to, you know, there'll always be fire, but it'll it'll go along the underbrush brush and it won't take out those big trees. Yeah. It'll be more natural fire. So there are a lot of those suggestions that using converting floodplains to be able to capture the water yeah. when it comes to save people, but also let it soak into the ground, create habitat for fish and wildlife. There's, there's a lot of um, movement in California towards a more holistic way of doing it. They just, Resources Agency just came out with a draft uh, Climate Smart California plan that's very encouraging. So there's a lot of that we could do, but really uh, in, in the urban context, conservation, recycling, and stormwater capture, and that's going on speed yeah. in Southern California in a very encouraging way. So Yeah, I mean, it's good to hear that the, uh, these ideas are actually being put into practice as well by these, by the big authorities who are uh, in yeah. control of it. Well, and it tends to be local areas that feel the crunch, so they're leading the way. The state is, I think, coming along nicely in some ways, not in mm. others, but nicely in some ways. In the Bay Area, you have this massive um, effort to where they raised half a billion dollars to use um, terrace wetlands to buffer sea level rise rather than more seawalls. Right. That's going to be yeah, awesome because of course, of course. you get the multiple benefits for habitat and green space and urban living and they're more resilient yeah. to buffering than a seawall, which actually accelerates the energy of the water towards somebody else. And yeah. so you end up with a war of seawalls where everybody loses. <laughs> so there's some really exciting stuff happening in California. Do we need to do more? Oh yeah, a lot more. Yeah, but yeah. the encouraging start over the last five years, I'd say. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it's good to hear that as well. Although there are a lot of problems, there are a lot of solutions that can be put yeah, forward. Yeah, absolutely. And dealing with all these things as one is a very encouraging way of looking at it. Um, I suppose the final sort of thing to end on would be to say if for people starting out in climate science or water resource management what would be your advice to to young people starting in this industry well first of all thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you you will save us all um i, I think uh, well i have a lot of suggestions but a couple of them one is you know follow your heart and figure out where you you the skills you tend to have mm -hmm. seem to add more value i mean sometimes people think that it's all universal, but we're all this different universe of talents and skills and, you know, some of us see things others do and then others see things we don't. So a tolerance and a embracing of that I think is important and I think getting to know yourself as you try different classes and different issues and figuring out what feels natural to you and where you feel, how you can follow your passion but also where you seem to have some natural skills is definitely a place to go rather than a theoretical idea of what you want to do. I can had more time I can say what I thought I wanted to do and it was insane in retrospect but eventually if you if you if you're just mindful enough about yourself and how you feel about things and where you seem to have a natural affinity you'll do the most good I also think it's important to take an integrated approach mm. where you're as multidisciplinary as you can be because that's the kind of thinking that we're going to need I'm sure to get a doctorate you need to specialize in certain things but it's also very important to take those classes in totally different areas because what we need are people who can integrate across traditional divides to come up with the most cost-effective and effective solution. So I think, you know, embrace the differences with other people, try and figure it out, figure out how to work on behalf of people, think of your community as much bigger than your neighborhood, yeah. you know, redefine it as the world if we're, if we're lucky and, um, and have a good time with it. Very much play to your strengths, but don't limit yourself to them. That's right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time, well, and I uh, really appreciate talking to us. Thank you.